Hello, Happy New Year, and welcome back to the first Monster Monday of 2021. Hopefully, which is going to be, and I say this tentatively, less of a massive dumpster fire than last year. For those of you who don't know, my Monster Mondays, this series of videos, are a series where I draw a creature from D&D, or from some sort of related mythology or folklore, and I translate it into D&D. I talk about what sort of lore and mythology and biology went into creating this creature, and how it applies to Dungeons and Dragons. What it's like to fight, in other words. And because there are a near limitless number of creatures from Dungeons and Dragons and outside of it that these videos could be about, I like to use your suggestions for videos that you'd like to see. And then my patrons over on Patreon get a chance to vote on which ones of your suggestions they like the most, and they get to tell me what they would like to see in a monthly poll. So if that sounds good to you, I'll make sure to leave a link down below to my Patreon, wherever, whatever side that goes on if you'd like to join in on the community over there, and make sure to leave a comment with what monster you'd like to see me draw and see my interpretation of. This week's suggestion was the Yarama Yahoo, or Yarama Yahoo, which was first suggested actually by two people almost simultaneously, weirdly. Uh, the first one was The Jurassic Show, also known as Yorick, one of my longtime patrons. So thank you very much, Yorick. And the other one was from Gith Yankee one who has been championing this creature's appearance for a really long time, actually. So I'm excited to get the chance to show you my version of a Yarama Yahoo and talk about what on earth this bizarre creature is. So let's get started. The Yarama Yahoo are frog or toad-like vampiric humanoids with bright red skin native to Australian Aboriginal mythology, who, rather than by means of fangs or sharp teeth, instead drain the blood from their victims through a series of leech-like suckers on their fingertips. Aside from their sanguine diet, the Yarama Yahoo could not be much more different from traditional Eastern European-inspired vampires that we're probably more familiar with. They're said to average out at four feet tall, and rather than dwelling in coffins, these small parasites are most at home hanging in the highest branches of a shady and leafy tree, having a particular preference for fig trees. They're exceptionally good climbers, using their long and powerful arms to do most of the hard work, which they can lock at the elbow, allowing them to dangle for many hours without effort. Due to their comparatively short legs, those long forelimbs drag behind them when they walk on the ground, and some depictions show them standing atop their hands, relying on them to do the walking, and using their feet instead to scratch at prey that they don't manage to ambush. And ultimately, ambush is the name of the game when it comes to the Yarama Yahoo. They'll dangle from a fig tree branch for as long as it takes to spot some particularly vulnerable prey. Once an unsuspecting victim is directly beneath them, these creatures will then drop onto their prey's backs, grappling them with their powerful arms and digging into them with these clawed feet, until they secure their leech-like sucker fingers to vital arteries and veins across the creature's body, ideally around the neck, and almost completely drain it of blood until this creature passes out. If the prey was humanoid, not traditionally human, but we're in a fantasy D&D world, you know, the Yarama Yahoo will then dislocate its massive, toothless jaws like a snake and swallow their prey whole, storing the almost dead creature in their throats or stomachs. Its tactics then fully switch to an intrinsic need to flee to safety with the body of its drained victim intact. If it manages to get away and relocate to safety, it'll find itself a safe spot near a river or lake to sleep, and it'll begin to then slowly transform the creature it has swallowed. Once the Yarama Yahoo wakes up, it'll regurgitate its victim, drink some of the nearby stream water, and then reconsume its victim a second time. The Yarama Yahoo then repeats this process over and over and over, adding more water to the blood sloshing around in its womb-like stomach. Every time it regurgitates its former victim, they shrivel a little bit, shrink, and become redder and redder, losing their teeth and hair, until eventually they are transformed into the Yarama Yahoo another one of these creatures themselves, reborn and forever altered into another blood-hungry sprite. Their ability to convert those that they drain the blood of is also very reminiscent of the traditional vampire, but they differ from them in the sense that the Yarami Yahoo is only active during the day. In fact, according to Aboriginal legends, 
The Yaramiyahu is only active during daylight and will only target living prey, sustaining nothing from scavenging corpses. A surefire way, therefore, to avoid a conflict with the Yaramiyahu if you suspect one is nearby is to convincingly play dead, although you'll need to do this until sunset potentially lying incredibly motionless for a whole day if you are unlucky enough to encounter one of these creatures during the morning, because their eyesight is particularly poor in the dark and they will refuse to hunt. It's possible therefore that like the T-Rexes of Jurassic Park, or certain depictions of Wendigos, these creatures might be so predatory that they have excellent vision for motion detection, but no affinity for night sight or dark vision in D&D. They may be completely blind to anything that's motionless, and so staying deadly still, making a performance check to not even quiver, not breathe too much in their presence, might cause them to not be able to notice you. While these creatures are not part of D&D officially, I'll endeavour to homebrew some stats for you, and leave a link to them below in my description section, because I can see a lot of applications for these creatures in D&D. There's so many creatures in the Monster Manual and beyond that have dark vision, because the game is based around the idea of you exploring a dark dungeon, and all of the predatory creatures within having the advantage over you, ideally relying on torches and things, back when humans were one of the few playable species that you had available to you. And now that so many playable species exist that can see in the darkness, it might be a great idea to flip this convention on its head and have a creature that can only see during daylight, and set up traps for your players where they'll have to remain motionless in order to avoid detection. Their similarities to vampires and their need to drain blood originally made me want to categorise these monsters as undead, but their affinity to the daylight made me reconsider this approach. Their blood bathing reminded me of a red cap's need to bathe its hat in blood to marinate it and maintain its colour. Its height, or lack thereof, reminded me of the many goblin-like sprites, gnomes and pixies of European legends, and its method of gestation through swallowing its prey and altering them from the inside reminded me of how hags kidnap children and transform them into their own kind through a very similar process. On top of all of this, the Yaramiyahu, just like the original Scottish legends of Redcaps, is a story designed to keep misbehaving children safe and away from harm by making them fear to travel too far beyond a village's tree line and out of sight of their parents, therefore, where genuine horrors may befall them in the scorching heat of the outback. For these reasons, I've decided to categorise these bloodsuckers as fey rather than undead, and because of their general frog-like shape and their stature, and their name which sounds like something of a battle cry that a goblin might make, it makes me envision their behaviour as cheeky, mischievous, and trickster-like, rather than full of malice, a personality that would be right at home in the Fae. I picture them with relatively low intelligence. I don't envision them with much, so that when they are transformed by this consumption process, they are fully transformed creatures with no memories of their past. Why else would they continue to attack living creatures? I imagine they'd also be fairly solitary, because of how often they're going to be finding people to jump down on, and by nature they probably wouldn't want to compete with one another. They also have no need to reproduce with one another. They are a transformatively reproducing species. They pass on a curse or a mutation by consuming new victims. So they have no need to be social. Well, at least not in terms of a biological imperative. So there's no strict need for them to be able to talk. Perhaps they know the languages that they knew in their previous lives before they were transformed and can understand them, but they can't speak. And their solitary lives, their competitiveness, and generally being a pain in the butt, probably means that they would have fairly low charisma, at least for the Fae. I would, however, envision them having brutally high strength due to their climbing limbs and their need to grapple their food. Their dexterity also needs to be fairly high, so they can climb and escape their prey, or dance around on their hands and attack with their feet. So I made these creatures small fey, and I gave them a chaotic evil alignment. I gave them an armor class of 12, and I gave them 6d6 plus 24 health points. I gave them a movement speed of 20 feet because it might be quite awkward for them to walk around on their arms or drag these massive limbs behind them if they walk on their feet, but conversely, I gave them a 30 foot climbing speed because that's clearly the environment they're most familiar with and adapted to survive in. Just like a piercer, I suppose I wanted to make it so that they could escape if they needed to, well, unlike a piercer in that case, but I wanted them to thrive in the trees and use their dropping mechanic as their main source of damage but then left as something not adapted to combat per se. It's designed to do a quick burst of damage and then escape if it can. 
to that end, they have a rule called Drop Hunters that says that the Yaramayahu are magical hunters with supernatural affinity for launching themselves at their targets from great heights, and as such they do not take falling damage. This is something that a DM may want to play around with, maybe you want to make them resistant to fall damage, or maybe you want them to convert their fall damage into something that they can apply to somebody else. But I'm making this a challenge rating 4 creature, unlike a piercer, which is much lower. Piercers, when they fall, can take damage from a fall, but only if they miss when trying to strike their prey. And I wanted to have something that, rather than this initial trap attack that it can perform, can still do some damage to players, and provide an interesting combat encounter, even if it messes up its initial attack. To that end, I actually gave this creature a multi-attack, allowing it to make two attacks with its toe talons. Its toe talons are a plus six to hit, and they deal 2d4 plus four damage each. Not massively exciting, but it gives this creature something to do while it's trying to either fend off attacks, escape, or damage players of higher levels once its drop attack has been performed. I allowed it to use its suckers, as a separate attack, which deal 1d6 plus 4 necrotic damage to creatures who aren't undead, constructs, elementals, you know, things generally without blood. Being vampiric, I said that the Yaramayahu regains health equal to the damage that it deals with this attack, and that it has advantage on this attack if it is grappling someone currently. Further to this, I said that if a character reaches 0 HP from this attack and falls unconscious, they instead count as dead, allowing the Yaramiyahu to make use of an ability called Consume, which is not an attack. I said that as a bonus action, and this is almost entirely stolen verbatim from the deadliness of a wisp, I said that as a bonus action, the Yaramiyahu can target one creature that it can see within 5 feet of it that has 0 HP and is still alive. The target must succeed on a constitution saving throw or die. If the target dies, the Yaramiyahu regains 3d6 HP as it consumes its prey. I then go on to say that a consumed target, just like the traditional rules for consuming a target, renders them unable to be targeted from the outside. If the Yaramiyahu dies, this creature is regurgitated, but if the Yaramiyahu manages to escape and take a long rest, then this consumed target returns to life as a new Yaramiyahu. So often the point of an encounter, or the fear perhaps, that players have in their encounters is that they might be walking into a TPK, a total party kill, but by making these creatures solitary and making them want to target one character only and escape with their body, it's a really interesting combat mechanic, it's a whole planned encounter in just one monster. You're not likely to encounter two Yaramiyahu at a time, and once they've knocked someone out, they're going to want to run away with it and flee to safety, they're want, going to want to avoid combat. So in the worst case scenario, rather than a TBK, you're only going to lose one character, and I thought that might be something really interesting, and I wanted to provide this creature with a sort of a phased combat system, where it's going to drop down and attack someone, try and kill them, then consume them, regain a lot of HP, so it's kind of like a new phase in this boss battle, and then with its new HP, and hopefully return to some semblance of close to maximum health, it's going to then try and flee, and your players have a chance to chase after it. The main damage from this creature though comes from its opening attack, this drop mechanic, which I pretty much took almost entirely from a piercer, but altered the damage a tiny bit to reflect the challenge rating of this creature being a challenge rating 4. I said that this attack has a plus 4 to hit, and can only target a creature directly underneath a Yaramiyahu. On a hit, this creature takes 2d4 plus 4 piercing damage per 10 feet that the Yaramiyahu has fallen, up to 12d4 plus 4, or roughly 48 damage. So that's enough to knock out most people, or be one hell of an opener. On a hit, the target is grappled by this creature's strong arms. It's a difficulty 16 to be able to get out of this grapple. And until the grapple ends, the target is restrained, and the Yaramiyahu cannot grapple other targets without releasing this one, basically. That should combine nicely with the sucker attack, which this creature gets advantage on if it's grappled to and hanging off of the back of someone that it's just landed on. When I was thinking about this dropping mechanic, I really wanted to embody the peregrine falcon. It's the fastest bird in the world, and in fact, may even be the fastest animal on earth. They fly to great heights and then mold their body almost into a bullet that rockets down to the ground in an enormous dive, reaching speeds of roughly 200 miles an hour 
which it does to gather speed enough to chase down its far smaller and far quicker prey that it would not be able to outfly otherwise, or to simply shatter the body of anything that it's going to manage to land on. It's like having a sniper rifle as a body. Now biologically, this is actually really hard to achieve. When you think about, you know, when you drive up a mountain or if you swim in a swimming pool or even the sea and go down quite deep or drive quite high up a mountain, you'll notice that your ears are likely to pop and that's because of air pressure changes or water pressure changes. If you've been in an aeroplane, for example, you'll notice that your ears pop when you are ascending and descending. And a falcon diving at 200 miles an hour is going to have these immense pressure changes ravaging its body while it's trying to hunt. It would be incredibly hard for it to concentrate. It may even do harm to this animal. But peregrine falcons have actually evolved a mechanism to subvert this. They have these bones, these bony tubes, that grow through their nasal cavity and out of their nostrils, which actually manage to guide these powerful air currents away from the nostrils so that these pressure changes happening in such quick succession don't actually collapse these birds' lungs. I wanted to include something like this in my Yarama Yahoo illustration, which I had to make human enough to look like the creature that it was originally from, that originally had been transformed, but also include frog-like or toad-like parts as well. And I was really stumped about this initially. Was I going to give this creature a beak? That seems like it would really subvert the whole nature of this beast looking frog-like and human-like. It needs to have a massive gaping mouth after all, and a round belly in order to be able to store a whole fully grown human inside. But thankfully, Australian Aboriginal culture has an answer that was just waiting for me, and that comes in the form of decorative nose bone jewelry. Many Aboriginal Australians pierce their noses with pieces of bone, usually kangaroo bone. And I was absolutely staggered to find that the oldest piece of surviving bone jewellery ever discovered was a piece of kangaroo bone believed to have originated from 44,000 BCE, which was unearthed by Sue O'Connor of the Archaeology and Natural History Department of the Australian National University. I wondered if this was still in practice and if this would be sort of lost or left behind a reference that no one would get. But I was really interested to find that Michelle Langley of the Australian Research Centre for Human Evolution says that, quote, I've met indigenous Australians who remember their grandparents wearing nose bones for special occasions, end quote, which she mentioned in a New Scientist article published in November 2016. So I thought with this being a creature from Australian Aboriginal mythology, I should really try and embody some of these celebratory parts of Aboriginal culture, using this nose bone as a springboard, something that mechanically would allow this creature to be able to dive and do its massive dive attack without collapsing its lungs from these air pressure changes just like a peregrine falcon. I wanted to include other Aboriginal elements to this thing. Helpfully, there's a great tradition of Aboriginal body art and body painting usually mixed from a collection of ochre, charcoal, and animal fat, and various other pigments extracted from leaves and flowers, used to decorate their bodies in these amazing and beautiful patterns. And these symbols and decorations are usually for celebrations and ceremonies or social gatherings, which are known as korobori. I'm probably pronouncing that really badly. Hopefully an Australian viewer in the comment section will be able to correct my pronunciation, but korobori is what it looks like to me. And these are usually filled with highly energetic dances and can mark occasions like massive festivals or, conversely, terrible strife and conflict, a bit like the Huckers of New Zealand, which seemed absolutely perfect for this creature's personality, something that's going to be dancing around on its hands, hard to hit because its movements are so unpredictable. A mixture of a jovial and cheeky celebration and a combat-infused deadly encounter. So I had to include some of these elements on this creature as well. And I'm really pleased with the result. I had no idea what a Yaramayahu might look like when I started drawing this. But all of these elements and these stories were really fascinating. And I'm really pleased with the result. So I hope you enjoyed it as well. And if you did, please make sure to leave a little like down below. And let me know if you use my stat block, again, left in the description box. 
in one of your campaigns. Let me know how that encounter goes. I'd love to hear about your ideas or if you know any obscure or strange legends from Australian mythology. It's something I'm very, very unfamiliar with, but I'm very enthusiastic to learn, especially if there are more amazing and crazy creatures like this. If you'd like to help the channel out, then please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a video from me. And if you really want to help out in a very personal way, and you like this drawing so much that you'd like a copy for yourself, then make sure to head over to my Patreon page, where backers get all sorts of rewards, but one of those is getting a copy of all of my illustrations each month if you back at the Monster Monday pledge level. But until next time, don't stray too far into the tree line, especially if there are very shady fig trees around, because you might be about to be attacked by drop bears, and happy monster hunting. Yeah.